What if humanity were to open itself to the oneness and sacredness of all beings, animate and inanimate? Imam Faisal Abdul Rauf. I'm Imam of a mosque about 12 blocks north of Ground Zero in Manhattan, New York City. I'm also a uh, trustee of the Islamic Center of New York, which is the largest mosque in New York City, and the founder of Asma Society, a society established to, uh, to further and to catalyze the discussion on the shaping of an American Islamic identity. Well, I was born in Kuwait of Egyptian parents, lived in, uh, grew up in England, in Malaysia, before its independence and since 1965 uh, in the United States of America. My father was a teacher of, uh, of uh, religion, but mainly the Islamic religion, and he was uh, sent by al Azhar University, which was then the premier university for Islamic studies, to help establish academic institutes of uh, learning, Islamic institutes of learning in Kuwait and in England, and he was in the United States a director and imam of the Islamic Center of New York and of Washington, D.C. My name is Kyriakos Markidis. I was born East Greek Orthodox and raised as a, as a Greek Orthodox. I came to the United States in 1960 uh, as a student, uh, but I've been in the U.S. now for the last 43 years. I became an American citizen in 1978 and I teach sociology at the University of Maine for the last 31 years. I came into the United States uh, with all kinds of prejudices and superstitions that I carried along from my, from my own background, particularly nationalism. And uh, I thought, for example, that the uh, the most superior culture was Greek culture and I used to be very ethnocentric but my encounters with so many other people in the United States with different value system different beliefs gradually chipped away from that ethnocentrism and before you are free to encounter spiritual realities you have to be liberated from this kind of cultural conditioning. I was brought up in a very pluralistic environment uh, where the, even my, my identity had to embrace uh, not only a Middle Eastern Arab Islamic identity, it had to embrace aspects of Western thinking because my, my, my uh, education was primarily in English, uh, brought up in the thinking modes both of the Orient and of the Occident, so to speak, uh, and in Southeast Asia as well. So I had to, to forge a worldview which uh, embraced and uh, was anchored in all these traditions. So when I, during my academic training as, uh, as a sociologist, by the time I finished my graduate studies, I was an agnostic. I was no longer a, you might say, a uh, quote unquote a naive believer uh, and that was not an easy state to be because I, I was a reluctant agnostic but given the kind of training I received in the universities I felt that religion and uh, was nothing more than uh, a, a social project the creation of society and it was later on that uh, once I came to Maine when I encountered transcendental meditation and reading about Native American shamanism, I began to have second thoughts. And then I began reading in the area of the interface between science and religion and spirituality. And I realized that that was an illusion, that in fact we are much larger what we assume and that deep down the whole universe is animated by spirit. Islam was a very important part of my life. It was the defining feature of my father's work and by virtue of his position as a uh, principal and rector of Islamic academic institutions, I had the good fortune to be surrounded by, uh, by many of the leading Islamic scholars of our time. 
who visited the university and came to our home for luncheons and dinners and sometimes uh, visits which over a span of a number of days or a week. And this afforded me the opportunity to somehow imbibe not only Islamic knowledge in, from the point of view of book learning, but to also to, to, to see exemplars of, of the Islamic faith tradition, Islamic intellectuals, Islamic thinkers, uh, and how they, how they behaved not only in the public sphere, but even in the private domain as well. Uh, and this afforded me the opportunity to get a, a depth, an in-depth sense of what it means to be an exemplar within the Muslim faith tradition. Yeah, I, I think the United States has a spiritual mission where people from different, radically different traditions and backgrounds can live in peaceful neighborliness. ASMA is an acronym for the American Sufi Muslim Association and it was founded to forge and shape the discourse and the discussion on what it means to be an American Muslim who is motivated by the spiritual aspect and ethical aspect of Islam. American society, by being multicultural, con can contribute to the opening up of the spiritual dimension of man, uh, of humanity because uh, we are forced to re-examine our limited identities. So as we encounter other people's other traditions and we are expected to live harmoniously in the same territory, we have to re-examine all that baggage that we bring along that tells us that we belong to the most superior culture in the world. We need to overcome that in order to embrace the world. We can practice our faith in a party sense, you know, like Democrat versus Republican, and, and we can we, we become caught up in that which differentiates us. Uh, and we can practice our faith by looking to what the eternal ethical foundations of our religion impels us towards. And when we anchor ourselves on and stand in that space, in that place. The, the way we, we speak, the, the, the walk we walk and the talk we talk relates us to what is common and eternal in the human condition. Uh, that people can learn to appreciate each other's culture and to begin looking upon the other as a human being first and foremost and then everything else. Out of many, one. E pluribus unum. I believe in the divinity of all of nature, and that includes the divinity of man as well. I believe that we are all part and parcel of nature. Uh, we are all part and parcel of God. Uh, that spark of divinity that resides inside me also resides inside that tree, uh, the bird, uh, the mountains, the rivers, the streams, uh, all of nature. We are all created by that, uh, that universal spark, whether you want to call it God, or the great spirit, as the Indians call it. Uh, Mr. Emerson calls it the oversoul. I prefer the term uh, universal intelligence. It is a divine spark that is inside each and every living thing and uh, each and every part of nature. So when you examine the history of religion in America, if you take, for example, the experience of the Christian communities as they emigrated from Europe to America, you primarily had, let's say, churches which were German churches, Norwegian churches, um, English churches. But after a generation or two, there, there became a need to express it as an American church. And therefore you have, for example, the Episcopalian church, which evolved out of the Anglican church. You had, even with Catholicism, you had, let's say, Irish Catholics, Italian Catholics, but then you had an American Catholic identity emerge from that. And this identity evolved out of the, of, out of the fermentation of ideas between the founding documents of this nation, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, 
the notion that every human being has the in unalienable rights to the pursuit of life, liberty, and, and happiness. The idea of all human beings are created equal, and they are endowed by certain rights. This is what John the Evangelist would say in the Gospel, that uh, all human beings have the Christ within. All human beings that come into it, it's the light that lighteth every human being that comes into the world, which means that the individual is sacred. And we find that notion in the American Constitution. The idea of a pluralistic society which, in which the state does not uh, push or endorse one particular church or one particular religious interpretation. America uh, is a place where one can freely express his or her views and ideas. And in this open system, human nature can find a fertile ground to express itself. What am, I, what am I saying? I'm saying that the openness of American society is conducive to the emergence of a spirituality that could have been suppressed in earlier periods and in other societies. America has established a framework where the human spirit and the human effort can blossom. It requires a sense of freedom. It requires the sense of the honoring of the rights of every human being so that a human being's individuality can emerge. That, that the sense of your you can be who you are as long as you honor the rights of the others. It, it, it is the development and articulation of what we call a social contract, which, which means those written and unwritten rules of behavior that govern how we live as a society, how we respect the other and at yet the same time be respected. So you might say that my academic training help me overcome that, to a great extent, my early cultural conditioning. But at the same time, it didn't offer me anything beyond that. That's why I got interested in mystics, healers, because they are speaking about a reality that was, uh, was over and beyond the culturally constructed reality. I think that in terms of spirit, uh, if you want to call it either spirit or genius, or conscience or what have you, there is that, that something that is inside each and every one of us uh, that goes beyond our five senses. Uh, that spirit is, is transcendental, if you wish, uh, that is beyond our, our sight and our sound, uh, our, our taste, our hearing. Uh, it is something that is a, a spark that is involved in everything around us. We are all tied together uh, in nature. And that is certainly something that the, uh, that the natives believed in and something that I believe in as well. It is a, a part of nature that includes me, but includes the cosmos as well. And everything within me and without me is all tied together by that universal spirit. This may be only one universe and a universe that is accessible with the five senses. But what if there are other universes over and beyond the uh, three-dimensional universe, then our sciences do not have access to these universes. And this is where we must go to those who are historically considered to be the experts that can offer us connections with these other worlds. The, the Creator has put the spirit in all of us. It seems to be more, it seems to be more pronounced and prevalent in the Indian ways but everybody has it, no matter what color, shape, form you may be, you have that. And that's this, how this body holds it. And so that's why everyone should honor and respect their own body and, and, and love their body, love themselves. So because they love themselves, they love that spirit that's in there. With that spirit, that spirit has so much knowledge, but you have to be so pure and clean that that knowledge can come through out of you and into your brain and you can project it and, and pass it on to other people. In similarities between the Pythagoreans of classical Greece, uh, the Greek mystical tradition, uh, the Christian mystical tradition, and the mystical tradition of Native Americans. Why? Because we share the same human nature. 
And deep down in every human being, there is spirit. And anybody who taps into that reaches the same kind of conclusions. What is it that enables an individual to know that he or she is doing right? Thoreau and Walden has a, a, a fascinating, very complicated passage about, and he begins the, the paragraph where he discusses this, he begins it with a, a pun. He said that an individual can be beside himself in a sane sense, uh, playing on this, you know, she's beside herself, she's crazy. Uh, uh, he's playing on that notion. But he basically says that you can either be, and then he uses, he descends to metaphor. He says you can either be, or maybe I should say ascends to metaphor. <laughs> he says, because that's in many cases the only way that you can tell the truth is by uh, telling a story or using these, uh, these artistic devices. But he uses the, the metaphor of uh, you can, a stream. You can either be driftwood, a piece of driftwood on the stream or Indra in the sky looking down on it. Uh, now, what Thoreau is suggesting in this paragraph is that you are actually, you can be both. In fact, you are both Indra in the sky and the driftwood in the stream. And if you look at the implications of the metaphor, Indra in the sky is kind of unchanging, obviously divine, has a higher perspective, and is able somehow to get a perspective on what's going on down there. Uh, what's down there is in flux. It's a stream. It's driftwood. It's refuse. It's less consequential. And Thoreau is saying that the individual can embody both of these perspectives, and I look at these fundamentally as perspectives, a perspective where you have chaotic change, flux, not too important, fairly insignificant, and at the same time embodied in the same individual. This is, my, you might say, the body. The, these are the, uh, the, dr the, uh, the driftwood on the stream is the, is the body, the thing that gets up in the morning and, and shakes off sleep and so on, as opposed to those rare moments when you can assume uh, or f however, you, however one is able to do it, is you take a higher view of things, the Indra in the sky view. The, the oneness of being has both a vertical, co what we call in Christianity, a vertical component and a horizontal component. When you experience this oneness of being, you, you somehow viscerally feel that you're one with the Creator, but you're also one with everything in creation. And it is easier to come in contact with um, with the spiritual world when you are surrounded by beauty than when you are surrounded by cement and ugliness. You feel at one with the trees, with the sky, with the stars, with the sun, with the sunset, with the color of the light. Because God is beautiful. is beauty and love and harmony. And if you live in a harmonious environment, uh, then that can trigger the inner beauty that you can discover within yourself. The, the particular shades of colors, you feel oneness with, with everything in the universe. If people lose contact with the, the beauty of the land, uh, it is much more difficult to come with the beauty that is inside us. So precisely halfway between uh, his arrival at Walden Pond and his departure from Walden Pond two years, two months, and two days later, Thoreau visits the Maine woods and climbs Mount Katahdin. Uh, about Thoreau, well, this area that we are living here inspired David Thoreau uh, in the direction of spirituality. And this is what happened to me when I came here, when I first encountered uh, med transcendental meditation. It happened to be in Maine, and it happened to be in a department that is very supportive of the work that I am doing with healers and mystics and so on. So maybe it's in the air of the land and in the, uh, and in the environment. And it's interesting to see what he has to say. There's, he, has, he actually has quite a, ver a long uh, passage about it, but what I'd like to do is just read what I regard as the most critical component of this long passage. It's, among Thoreau scholars, it's, it's fa fairly well known as the contact passage, and you'll see why in a moment. Here's, again, he's at, the he's at what he believes is at the top of Mount Katahdin, and he's explaining later to his readers what the significance of that was. I stand in awe of my body. This matter to which I am bound has become so strange to me. I fear not spirits, ghosts of which I am one, that my body might, 
but I fear bodies. I tremble to meet them. What is this Titan that has possession of me? Talk of mysteries. Think of our life and nature. Daily to be shown matter, to come in contact with it. Rock, trees, wind on our cheeks, the solid earth, the actual world, the common sense. Contact, contact, who are we? Where are we? If one just feels and listen to, to what is happening around you, you become, you become one with the mountain in a sense that you're part of a living entity. So there's like a heartbeat. There's a heartbeat. There's a connection there, a real connection on the spiritual sense. And it, for me, it touches my soul because of the beauty that I see around me. What Katahdin portrays, it, you know, you can hear it in the, in the voice of the wind crying across knife's edge, blowing up, the, up, the, up above the mountain. You can hear it in the, the crashing of the thunder as it comes down and, and hits, the, hits the land. You can see it in the, in the clouds, the way the clouds come over Katahdin and engulfs it. You know, people have climbed that mountain for, for many, 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 many years and they go back. And if you just, if you stop and listen to the sounds that the mountain is, is, and what the mountain, the vibration of the mountain, what it's giving off, you can feel, you feel that. And you, I don't know, maybe I just have a, a, a much more connectedness to that land, to, to, to the mountain in that sense. But the, but the rocks speak, the trees speak, everything speaks, it has spirit, it's alive. But you have to sense it and be able to feel that, become one with, one with the mountain, one with nature more or less. But nature is all around us, so the mountains speak for itself. And it draws people there. It draws people that come there who are non-Indians, and they don't know the reason why they are drawn there. But they are drawn there because of the spirit, the spirit of the mountain. Katahdin, Katahdin lives. I mean, it breathes, and it can tell you stories. One of the more, uh, I think it's fairly famous, this whole notion that Thoreau had that heaven is under your feet as well as over your heads, I think is a really critical insight, uh, and it's a wonderful way to put it. Because through this kind of spiritual understanding, we'll come to terms with the earth, and this is what Native Americans can teach to modern Americans, that if, you want, if we want to survive in the long run, we have to reestablish a loving relationship to the earth. Traditionally, of course, heaven has been somewhere else. And what Thoreau, I think, was very, very interested in grounding heaven in this, this reality, that heaven is available and accessible to people now. A lot of people live in two realities. One reality is the reality of their everyday world, and the other reality is a more inner reality that they are afraid to articulate because our culture has shut its doors to inner realities. And we need to open them up and incorporate this understanding, not only among ordinary people, but within the academic environment. One of the more important things I think that Thoreau has to offer us nowadays is this insight into the miraculousness of this reality that we can, from one perspective, it's just commonplace, but from another perspective, it's, it's not commonplace at all. It's uh, what Carlos Castaneda called a separate reality, uh, a reality that is imbued with everything that uh, all of the human traditions have called sacred, uh, as opposed to the more mundane, not necessarily profane, but mundane uh, reality, the one, that, you know, the work-a-day world, uh, the world of getting and spending. And because science cannot study anything over and beyond his realm, some scientists assume that there is no world beyond that. And therefore, if you come up with this conclusion, then automatically we arrive at nihilism. Uh, it, it's a very nihilistic philosophy that can lead people to um, self-destruction. So. We need a spiritual understanding of our place in the universe if we are to survive as a species. Thoreau and his tradition and his, uh, and his practice took very seriously. He wanted to operate in the world, but he also did it with an eye, you might say, on the next world, uh, on what he called the higher world. And of course, 
That's what artists do is they make metaphors to try to uh, communicate this fundamental insight that there is this separate sphere that's important. And uh, I think that's what Thoreau as an artist was attempting to do. He was using the prophetic tradition to do that. He was adding to the prophetic tradition to do that. Uh, he was looking to Native American cultures and other cultures around the world, but particularly seemed to be interested in Native American cultures to leverage the strengths and the insights of those cultures to improve upon this experimental new American culture that had emerged in the new world. Uh, he wanted, as he said, to keep the new world new. And to do that, he drew, he wasn't being necessarily revolutionary, although I think it's fundamentally revolutionary, but he was drawing on existing or pre-existing cultures and insights the Judeo-Christian cultures and insights, the Native American cultures and insights, taking those and bringing them together in a dynamic mix that worked for him and that he appears to have thought would work for the rest of the country. And we can learn a great deal from the way that the Indian has lived here in our land, their respect for nature, their use of the land, uh, their belief that we are all part of the Great Spirit, that the Great Spirit created the world for our use, but also for us to live in harmony with the world around us. Using this imagery, so to speak, God created human beings to be mirrors. Because, because then, what, what does it mean to say divine image? Divine image means God created us as mirrors in which God wanted to see itself reflected. So the process of submission to God, the process of becoming a spiritually evolved human being, involves improving and perfecting our mirror quality. And therefore in Sufism you'll find things of removing the rust on your heart because you know in traditional times mirrors were made out of out of metal which was which was then polished in which you'd see the reflection. And based upon the the perfection of the mirror, you know, you have bad mirrors where your nose gets out of shape and, you know, it, it distorts you. So you want a mirror which is, which is as transparent as possible. And therefore the ideal human being from this Sufi Islamic point of view is a human being who is as transparent as possible to the, to the divine presence. The prodigal son left the palace to experience the world uh, and uh, he got all messed up. He, uh, he lived with the pigs and at a certain point there is exhaustion with that kind of lifestyle. And then the inner self begins to come forward and say, hey, wait a minute now. I am a prince and I should be in the palace. That's when the individual begins to look inward in search of that higher reality, the, the heavenly palace that every human being is headed towards. The spiritual traditions not only teach us and speak about this, but it also it takes us on this journey. How do we surrender? Because Islam means surrender. How do we surrender ourselves experientially so that we, we know, not just know in our minds, but know experientially that we are a piece of God, a piece of the Divine Spirit. And that uh, we have made a mistake to assume that we reach God through our intellects. We have to reach God through the cleans cleansing of our hearts. And I think Henry David Thoreau understood that, that there is an inner reality that uh, we need to contact. And in the process of doing that, we'll become more perfect. Martin Luther King Jr. and Gandhi and, and uh, prophets are somehow able to achieve that view. And what that view does is it gives a perspective on the driftwood in the stream. It gives a perspective on the life of getting and spending, the life of the body, the life of flux. Idea that inspired Martin Luther King to start the civil rights movement because he was calling Americans to live up to the ideals of the Constitution. And part of the role of America is to, is to help other nations express these principles within the cultural modalities of their own societies. So all these struggles that we've had in the United States, uh, the civil rights movement, the, 
the rights of minorities, all of these things were a necessary struggle for the development of this kind of consciousness. And uh, we are responsible in many ways uh, to teach to the rest of the world this kind of neighborliness. Therefore, when we violate those norms, whether it is in our foreign policy or whether we violate them in our domestic affairs, we violated the soul of America. American people are more concerned with their pocketbooks than they are about justice in this world. For instance, uh, most of the people in Concord wear clothing made out of cotton. Well, where does that cotton come from? It comes from, from Negro bondage and from slavery, of course. Yet, the people of Concord do not concern themselves about where it comes from. Uh, they're more concerned about uh, manufacturing. They're more concerned about agriculture. They're more concerned. They're more more concerned with the the latest fashions and the latest styles than they are about uh, the fact that there are three million people in bondage even as we speak. They are concerned about having the biggest houses or the nicest yards uh, or uh, the latest music box or what have you. Uh, they read about the war in Mexico in the daily papers. Uh, they read about slavery in the daily papers, yet as soon as breakfast is over and they are done drinking their coffee, they forget about everything that they have just read, and they go on about their daily business as if nothing has ever happened. That which is polarized in, in favor of the divine imperative, which is towards compassion, love, and harmony, and the other dimension, which is, which is towards dissonance and breakage and separation, Peter M. Sorokin, the founder of the Harvard Sociology Department, he predicted in the 30s that we are moving into an age of spirituality and faith because materialist civilization has exhausted itself and the pendulum is swinging in the direction of a spiritual renaissance. And then it, it urges us to commit ourselves to the path of being the bridge, of being the um, if you will, soldiers for peace, uh, struggling and waging and, and, and fighting the battles in people's in hearts and minds to inform them as to what the, the righteous way of living is, the right way of living is, and that there is enough space on this world and in this universe for everybody to live prosperously. So all of these trials and tribulations is part of this process. And we in the United States have experienced the illusion of prosperity as the way to happiness. And we realize that's not the way to happiness. America created a sense of prosperity because prosperity at the end of the day doesn't come from land or from oil or from anything else. It comes from, the, from the, the unleashed freedom of the human creative mind. That the 21st century either will become spiritual or it will not be. Uh, and I think the United States is in the forefront of this spiritual revolution, if we are going to have a 21st century. But we have to understand, we, we have to become spiritual, not uh, religiously fundamentalists that um, pushes us in the direction of separating ourselves from the rest of the world. You know, we need the spirituality that enhances our compassion and a, a spirituality that embraces the world. Onward from Scrooby, England to the future with Connie Baxter Marlowe, Mayflower Pilgrim descendant. I'm Connie Baxter Marlowe, and I'm a descendant of five of the Mayflower pilgrims who came across from England in the 1600s on this little ship. Uh, we're, uh, we're putting together a little documentary that begins with their ideas and vision of freedom. In the evolving consciousness of humanity, there's been a thread of choice, of living life according to your own individual choice a self-determining way of living in community that allows an individual to flower, 
allows an individual to bring his gift to the community through his own personal choice. And that thread of, of this evolutionary process began for this country, began and for humanity, since we are the evolving uh, democracy, this thread started in Scrooby, England in the early 1600s. The Mayflower Pilgrims in England weren't known as the Mayflower Pilgrims. They were known originally as Puritans. They wanted to purify the Church of England. People realized that there was no way they were going to purify the Church of England, that they would have to separate from the Church of England. And they set about creating a group of people who, who committed treason, essentially against King James. King James was an absolute monarch who wanted absolute obedience and they said, I don't think so, King James. The Bible had been uh, translated into English. It was on their table and they wanted to gather together with their friends and discuss the scriptures, discuss the information that was in the Bible. And they gathered together and, and created this uh, group of separatists. This group of separatists met on a regular basis. They were persecuted, they were harried, they were spied upon, and to the point that they were no longer comfortable in their own land. They sold their worldly possessions, and they gathered up their children, and they attempted twice to escape from England. They were betrayed and sent back home and put in jail. But since these people were Cambridge-educated principal players in their community, they didn't know what to do with them in the jails. So they turned them out of the jails and a year or so later they made another attempt to escape from England and were successful and went to Holland where they lived for 12 years. The people decided they didn't want to become, their children to become Dutch and they set out for a new world where they could establish a nation that was based upon freedom of conscience, freedom to choose. So they set sail from Plymouth, England, uh, 50 of these people with another 50 what's called adventurers or um, strangers, and they set sail across the ocean. It took 60 days. When the Mayflower arrived in Provincetown Harbor, they realized, the people there on the ship realized that they were not in Virginia, for which they had a patent from King James. They were, in fact, Far, much farther north, and there was, there was talk of mutiny on the ship. So with the talk of mutiny, of everyone being every man for himself, when they set foot on this soil, the people pulled everyone together and they sat down in the hold of the Mayflower and they drafted a document, the Mayflower Compact, which the essence of this document is that they agreed to pull themselves together into a civil body politic and enact and create equal and just laws that would serve the common good. They also agreed that they would elect and create offices and officers to enact these laws and that they would swear their obedience to these offices and officers. So right here you have in its essence democracy, a, an agreement by a community to live by common consent. And this is uh, what our founding documents of freedom, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the spirit of America is based on these principles. These pilgrims, once they landed here, put those principles to work. And within a few months, upon their first meeting with Massasoit, the great chief of the Wampanoag Indians, sat down and drafted yet another document a peace treaty, a six-point peace treaty between the Wampanoags and the Pilgrims that was to last for 50 years. They lived in brotherhood and friendship with the Wampanoags for a generation. I have a little, a, a little book here called Good News from New England, and this was written by Edward Winslow, who was a principal player with the Pilgrims. And um, at one point, he went to the Wampanoag Indians. Uh, Massasoit was very ill. The chief of the Wampanoags was dying. And Edward Winslow went to 
see Massasoit and, and brought him a life-saving remedy. And upon his departure from this, this experience, one of the uh, heads of the um, Wampanoags asked him how he dared come forth into Indian country the way he did, just two of them. And he, he responded, and I wanted to read, he answered, where was true love, there was no fear, and my heart was so upright towards them that for mine own part I was fearless to come amongst them. There was such a feeling of love that these pilgrims held for humanity and for each other and for the native people. It's something that we at this time have little understanding of and it will um, behoove us to come to understand this founding nature of these Mayflower pilgrims and their relationship with the Wampanoag people. The principles that drove these people ultimately became the founding principles of our country. Benjamin Franklin's first assignment was to go to Albany, New York and create a treaty with the Iroquois nations. He discovered that the Iroquois had in fact a system of government that had been in place for 500 years that was based on democratic principles. And he took from these uh, Iroquois people, he picked up these principles and brought them to the Constitutional Convention and incorporated them in our Constitution. It was the coming together of the high ideals of the Mayflower Pilgrims and the Founding Fathers with the principles of democracy found in the Iroquois Confederacy that created our great Constitution. What are we going to do with these principles? The Great Seal of the United States, E Pluribus Unum, out of many, one. Anuit Coeptus, Providence has favored our undertakings. Novus Ordo Seclorum, a new order of the ages. The Great Seal, the shield made of 13 red and white stripes represents the several states all joined in unity. The colors in the shield are those of the flag. White signifies purity and innocence, red, hardiness and valor, blue, perseverance and justice. The olive branch and 13 arrows denote the power of peace and war. Over the head of the eagle, which appears above the shield, a glory, or breaking through the cloud, surrounds 13 stars forming a constellation. The constellation denotes a new state taking its place and rank among other sovereign powers. The shield is borne on the breast of an American eagle without any other supporters to denote that the United States of America ought to rely on their own virtue. Reverse. The pyramid signifies strength and duration. The eye over it and the motto allude to many signal interpositions of providence in favor of the American cause. The date underneath is that of the Declaration of Independence and the words under it signify the beginning of the new American era, which commences from that date. The Great Seal was adopted by the Continental Congress June 20th, 1782. Great Seal Description, Charles Thompson. June 20th, 1782.